While there are a myriad of reasons for the demise of MySpace, today we'll be discussing one of the saddest footnotes in the website's history, a death that tarnished the company's reputation for good. Megan Taylor Meyer was born on November 6, 1992 in the state of Missouri. Described as a goofy and bubbly child, she loved to spend time out at the lake with the family. But despite her personality, a life wasn't nearly as easygoing as it seemed. In just the third grade, she contemplated her life for the first time. Following this incident, the young girl began seeing a psychiatrist, where she was diagnosed with ADHD as well as depression. Megan struggled to make friends and suffered from self-esteem issues, though there was some hope. She finally did find someone to talk to, befriending a classmate who lived on the same street named Sarah Drew. It was a somewhat unstable relationship and had many breaks, but at the end of the day, they were joined at the hip and spent a lot of time after school together. Like many teens, when Megan entered middle school, she took it as a chance to reinvent herself. In the seventh grade, the teen desperately yearned for the approval of the popular kids, but this didn't turn out very well at all. Rather than helping their new peer, they instead took her up as a new target, mocking the young lady relentlessly for her weight. The ridicule led her to stop eating at school altogether, yet even still, it didn't stop. This bullying from classmates became so debilitating that Megan would begin and end every school day by crying. Eventually, she begged her parents to either be homeschooled or transferred to another district. Ron and Tina, who at this point had witnessed it firsthand, understood, and made arrangements for their daughter to attend a nearby Catholic school instead. It was a risk, but in the end, appeared to be a change for the better. Within three months, Megan had found herself a new social group, even becoming confident enough to join the volleyball team. As a result of these changes, however, she began to grow distant from her best friend, Sarah Drew, before deciding to cut her off entirely. While life wasn't perfect, all in all, the teen was in good spirits, and happier than she'd ever been before. But the biggest positive effect on her outlook wouldn't be because of real-life changes at all, instead originating from the attention she received through an online profile on MySpace. You have to understand that before Facebook or TikTok, MySpace was the go-to social networking site in the mid-2000s. Having amassed over 70 million users at the time, in 2006, it managed to surpass Google as the most visited website in the United States. Naturally, this attracted the attention of many young people, including Megan, who couldn't help but be drawn to the website. Although the platform's terms of service required that all users be at least 14 years of age, the policy was often ignored. Because of this, in the years prior, Megan as well as other young people had been able to make catfish profiles, using other girls' photos to talk to boys online. When Megan's mother found out about this, she immediately ended her daughter's access. But now on the cusp of her 14th birthday, in the fall of 2006, Megan approached her mom to plead for another chance on MySpace. Tina relented, only stipulating that she and Ron be allowed to monitor the account at all times. Once Megan had set up the legitimate profile, she was quickly added by a 16-year-old boy named Josh Evans, who just moved into town. Looking to meet people in the area, he introduced himself by stating she was pretty. Not used to this kind of attention, she immediately fell head over heels for him. Megan begged her mother to allow her to accept the request, and eventually Tina gave in. With that, their communication began. From the very beginning, red flags existed, warning that things weren't entirely as they seemed. Whenever Megan asked for his phone number, he claimed that neither he or his mother had one, despite having managed consistent internet access. Regardless, the momentum of their young romance couldn't be stopped, as Megan's eyes remained on the screen from the moment she arrived home. According to Ron, it was the happiest she'd ever been in her life. 
With her birthday approaching, Tina took the young girl to pick out a new dress. Things were looking great overall, as they had planned a grand entrance for its reveal at the party, where her dad would carry her down the stairs to the guests. But as her birthday approached, her MySpace relationship took an abrupt turn. When on October 15th, 2006, she received a message from Josh simply reading, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. You're not a nice person. From Megan's perspective, this comment came completely out of the blue. She attempted to ask the boy what he meant, but received no response. With the family's computer in the basement, she mulled over the thought alone, contemplating how something or someone could have caused this. The only thing she knew for certain was that it clouded over everything else going great in her life. The next day should have been a happy one for Megan. She planned to hand out invitations to her birthday party at school. Instead, the sky was bleak as rain poured from above. Though she did follow through with the cards, the middle schooler's mind was fixated on what occurred the night before. When she finally did get home, Megan frantically asked her mother to check MySpace to see if he responded. Her mother did so, but was in a rush due to an appointment for their other daughter. She couldn't stay around to monitor her, so the agitated teen was left to her own devices on MySpace, with no one to keep things under control. Upon logging in, Megan discovered that Josh had not only replied aggressively, but began sharing her embarrassing messages to the public. To make matters worse, others on the site began to join in, with the bulletin even started with two options, Megan Meyer is a slut, and Megan Meyer is fat. The 13-year-old, now sobbing hysterically, frantically responded with the most vulgar insults that came to mind. She called her mother several times as well, who simply shouted for her to log off. When Tina finally returned home, she rushed to the basement to address the situation at hand. Rather than comfort her daughter, she chastised Megan for using inappropriate language. Megan shouted back, You're supposed to be my mom! You're supposed to be on my side! Before running upstairs to her second-story bedroom. Tina didn't think much of it at first. She consulted her husband as the two began making dinner while discussing what had happened. Then after approximately 20 minutes, Tina began to feel a wave of despair pass over her. On impulse, she ran upstairs to her daughter's room, opening the door to discover that her daughter had hung herself using a belt in her closet. At the age of 13, Megan Meyer had passed away. Soon after the tragedy, Ron returned to the computer downstairs, where he discovered the last conversation Megan ever had. Having been locked out of the MySpace account, these occurred through the AOL Instant Messenger. Josh Evans had written a DM stating, Everybody in O'Fallon knows how you are. You are a bad person and everybody hates you. The world would be a better place without you. In response, Megan replied, You're the kind of boy a girl would kill herself over. The funeral was held three days later on October 20th, 2006. Megan's body was dressed in the very same outfit they picked out for her birthday a few days earlier. Tina and Ron attended grief counseling as well as meetings concerning parents after loss and suicide. The neighborhood was tight-knit, and so the sense of mourning was felt by all its residents. They reached out to Lori and Kurt Drew, the parents of Megan's former best friend Sarah, to console them. Tina let Sarah know that although the two had their ups and downs, Megan truly had valued their friendship. Although their houses had always been only four doors apart, the mutual sense of loss made them feel even closer. The harasser's account had been deleted shortly after reports of Megan's death began to surface. In response, law enforcement started investigating, only to be unable to find any proof of the boy existing at all. They had few leads, with difficulties getting the account reinstated by the social networking giant. Then, on November 18th, 2006, the Myers received a phone call from a neighbor insisting they had information about Josh's identity. 
Kathy. While not familiar with this woman, they reluctantly agreed, arranging to talk in person at a counselor's office. There, the single mother informed them that the profile had not only been created by people Megan knew, but it had been coordinated by adults. In an absurd twist of events, she revealed that the account had been created by Sarah Drew's over 40-year-old mother, Lori. We'll learn more about this after a brief word from our sponsor. The new year is upon us, and to start it off right, maybe you should consider getting a Manscaped product. For this video, they actually hooked me up with a bunch of stuff from their all-in-one performance package 4.0 kit. While there's plenty of stuff in here that I love to go over, the Lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer is the true standout. This waterproof trimmer with advanced skin-safe technology reduces nicks and cuts on the most sensitive regions of the body. On top of this, it includes a super smart cordless charging system that has 30 minutes of juice on a full charge. And let's not forget about the weed whack. It's a wireless nose trimmer with the same skin safe technology. So to try out this amazing line of products for yourself, go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts when you use promo code MARS at checkout. In a strange turn of events, it was revealed that the harasser of the dead middle schooler had not been a teenage boy as they thought, let alone a teenager at all. To the shock of the grieving parents, the neighbor explained that this catfishing scheme had been orchestrated instead by the middle-aged mother of Megan's former best friend, Sarah Drew. Lori had apparently created the account to mess with Megan, conspiring with her daughter and another woman to flesh out the hoax. This other culprit was an 18-year-old named Ashley Grills, the whistleblower's daughter. As the story goes, Ashley had worked with Lori at the time, and not only had access to the account, but even sent the very last message Megan ever saw. The woman then revealed that after learning of her death, Lori called advising her not to speak with police or mention MySpace. Ron and Tina felt confused, betrayed, but above all else, furious. Having kept a foosball table in storage for the Drew family as a favor, they immediately began destroying it with a sledgehammer and axe. They then dumped its remains on their driveway, spray painting the words Merry Christmas on the box. Surmising from this that the family now knew of what they had done, Lori and her husband walked over to the Myers home attempting to clear the air on how they contributed to Megan's death. Ron instructed friends to tell the two to leave before he lashed out physically. Despite the warning, the Drew family continued to try to talk things out with the Myers, coming back time and time again, refusing to leave when requested, including on Thanksgiving. This would sometimes escalate to Lori banging on the door in order to instigate the conversation. The Meyer family did not want an explanation, because realistically, none would suffice. Megan was so close with the Drews that she'd even gone on vacation with them, meaning they were at the very least aware she took antidepressants. Bizarrely, on November 25th, Lori Drew filed a police report in order to document the current tension of the neighborhood. In the office, chance that any of her property was damaged further. Here she recounts her side of events, including some blatant fabrications, such as that the most damning messages were sent by hackers. But most interestingly, the world would finally hear her motivation for conceiving the account in the first place. To put it bluntly, it was simply to find out if Megan was gossiping about her daughter. Drew said she, with the help of a temporary employee named Ashley, constructed a profile of a good-looking male on MySpace in order to find out what Megan was saying online about her daughter. Drew stated she, her daughter, and Ashley all typed, read, and monitored the communication between the fake male profile and Megan. Drew went on to say the communication became sexual for a 13-year-old. Drew stated she continued the fake male profile despite this development. Not only is all of this very self-incriminating, but the self-admitted troll mom bizarrely stated on record that she did not feel as guilty because at the funeral she found out Megan had tried to commit suicide before. 
In light of all these revelations, the story became a national sensation as people from across the world demanded the three perpetrators be punished. Both the local and federal investigation were initiated into the matter. However, there were no laws at the time criminalizing cyberbullying. Because of this, despite the confessions, no one could be legally held responsible. Interestingly, Lori was found guilty in 2008 for violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, centering around allegations that she'd committed fraud by breaking MySpace's terms of service. The conviction was eventually vacated due to its dangerous precedence, with the federal judge stating that they did not intend to criminalize the conduct of which Drew was accused. This was for good reason, as if it were upheld, anyone could be arrested for lying about their age online going forward. Although its outcome was thrown out, the trial was important as it led to many aspects of the case being cleared up in court. Sarah admitted while under cross-examination that Megan had confided about being suicidal to her, both in person and in an email the year prior. However, she explained that Megan was a bad friend, who called her a lesbian as well as fat and ugly. The prosecutor then inquired, and you said bad things to her? To which the now 16-year-old responded, never. Sometimes. I'm a good person though. While Lori attempted to claim that she was unaware of the cruel messages, it directly contradicted past and present testimonies. Ashley testified that Lori was aware about half the time she and Sarah sent messages, but most critically, all three were present during the final argument of Megan's life, with each suggesting ideas and contributing to the final interaction. Upon realizing that none of what transpired was illegal, a concerted effort was made to legislate against cyberbullying. A movie in favor of this movement was even made loosely based on the Myers case, which went on to be mocked incessantly online after its release. Tina and Ron, unable to overcome the guilt of what occurred, separated on amicable terms. The former would go on to create the Megan Meyer Foundation to spread awareness about internet harassment. As for the Drew family, just because they avoided legal repercussions doesn't mean they got off scot-free free. Their names were derided across the world. In one incident, local kids decided to shoot paintballs at their sunroom window. In another, a brick was thrown. Ironically, it became so bad that they were forced to leave entirely when cyberbullies got a hold of their address and phone number to continuously harass them. In conclusion, the case of Megan Meyer was one of the first large stories to shed light on the issue of cyberbullying and soon after, MySpace started its decline. Even if the case wasn't the reason for the social network's demise, it certainly did show the dangers such a platform had on developing minds. So there you have one of the earliest examples of cyberbullying on social media, an issue we're still talking about to this very day. And with that, I think I'll end the video here. So until next time, thanks for watching.